This is the first of three videos for the Snapmaker A250T. And if you guys are familiar with the A250T, you'll know that it is a three-in-one machine. And that means it can do 3D printing, CNC machining, and laser cutting. So there's a lot to cover with this thing here. And so that's why I split this up into three separate videos. Now in this first video, I'm gonna be covering the general assembly of the machine, as well as the 3D printing module. Now for the 3D printing module, I already have some upgrades that I will announce at the end of the video. So please stick around for that. And at the end of the video, I have a new community project that I want you guys to get involved in. So I just wanna say a big thank you to Snapmaker for sending me this machine so I can make this video for you guys. I really appreciate it. Let's get started. We'll begin by unboxing the A250T. As you would hope, this machine comes very well packaged and right at the top of your box, you'll find a beautifully printed quick start guide. This is a very high quality manual that's clear and easy to follow. And seeing how this is the first thing you're presented with as it comes out of the box, it really sets the tone for the quality that you'll expect from the rest of this machine. Neatly packed under the quick start guide, you'll find all of the linear modules lined up in a row. They are all very clearly labeled on top, and this is important because not all of them are identical. Below that, you'll find various other components, such as the three different tool heads, all conveniently packaged in one box, tools and accessories, adapters and brackets, a bunch of cables, as well as the power module. And of course, we're not done there. This was a pretty heavy box, so there's still more to go. Below that, we have the main controller, we have the touchscreen, a sample roll of filament, as well as the various work platforms. And on the very bottom, there's the machine base. Now we'll go through the general assembly, and the manual was excellent and easy to follow, but some people like to also follow along with a video. Inside of the tools and accessories box, you'll find a nice little toolbox that has all of the hardware and tools that you'll need for the operation of this machine. The manual claims we only need this single screwdriver with this one hex bit to assemble the entire thing. So let's see if that's true. The base is up first and it seems like it is a piece of cast aluminum that's been machined with all of the holes and slots and then beautifully anodized. There's a small package of M4 by 10 screws along with the rubber feet and those will screw into the four corners of that base. Now we'll grab the two linear modules with the 20 millimeter lead. Carefully unbox them and do not press on that steel strip running down the middle. The manual explicitly states not to do this and I made a very conscious effort not to even touch them at all. The manual also instructs you to take the two carriages and push them down to the middle of the modules and line them up. Within the work platforms box, we'll find what's simply known as the platform. And as we perform the next step in the assembly, we have to pay attention to the orientation of this platform. You'll see these nuts here and they'll be facing up. And this is where we'll take our linear modules, flip them upside down, and use the M4x8 socket head cap screws to secure the modules to the platform. Do not tighten these screws at this point. Your assembly should look something like this with the screws not fully tightened. You'll find a series of threaded holes on the bottom of the linear modules and you're going to want the cables facing away from you and you're gonna want these slots in the base also facing away from you at this point. You're gonna use more M4x8 socket head cap screws and you're going to attach the base to the bottom of those linear modules. The grooves on the base help align the two linear modules and now we can go back and fully tighten those screws holding the platform to the linear modules and you can do that through those holes in the bottom of the base. Then we can find our box with the adapters and brackets. Inside of there, we're gonna grab the two 90 degree brackets. These two metal brackets will be positioned upright onto the base and you'll see two recesses that have been machined into the top of the base to make these very easy to locate. Each bracket will receive four M4x8 socket head cap screws and those can be inserted through the bottom of the base. These screws can be fully tightened at this point. Next, we can pop open the touchscreen box and in the touchscreen box, you'll find the touchscreen mount. Similar to the two brackets we just looked at, the touchscreen mount will mount to the top of the base. It'll be facing the other direction. It uses M4x8 socket head cap screws and these ones we can also fully tighten down. Now we need two more linear modules. This time they have the lead of eight millimeters printed on the box. Same as before, unbox the linear modules. Be very careful not to press on those steel strips. We're gonna be mounting those linear modules to these 90 degree brackets and we're gonna be 
feeding the cable through the hole in those brackets and the base. Each of these modules will get six M4 by eight socket head cap screws that will fasten the module to the 90 degree bracket. At this point, these screws are not to be fully tightened. Here you can see all six screws now in place and you're going to be repeating this exact same process on the other side. When you're finished, it will look something like this and then you're gonna need more of those M4 by eight socket head cap screws. Four more of those screws will get inserted through the bottom of the base and they'll thread into the bottom of those upright linear modules. We will not be tightening those screws, at least not until we get this next single 20 millimeter lead linear module installed as our X gantry. As with all of the other linear modules, don't press on the steel strip. Then we can take the platform and press it towards the front of the machine, push it using the middle of the platform. Next, we're gonna grab our bag of M4 by eight socket head cap screws, and we're gonna to begin to attach that new linear module to the carriages of the upright linear modules. Looking at the machine from the back, pay attention to the position of those M4 by eight screws. Also make sure your cable is exiting on the proper side. Now we can go back and tighten all of the other screws. Now the manual brings to your attention that you should keep those Z carriages at the same horizontal height, but it tells you this after you've gone ahead and tightened these screws. I would say pay attention to the horizontal alignment of those carriages before you tighten the screws because any misalignment will cause problems down the line. Back in the adapters and brackets box, you'll find these cable splitters. Pay attention to the orientation of the splitter. The side with the two receptacles will be facing the front of the machine. We're going to be using M4 by 30 socket head cap screws to attach the splitters to the base of the machine. These screws awkwardly sit in these slots and the head is supposed to grab the edge of the adapter, but it doesn't really do a great job of that. So do not over tighten them as you'll start to bend and skew the adapter. Now you can take your Y axis cables, route them under the platform and then up through the slot in front of the adapter and plug them into the adapter. Inside of the controller box, you'll find more of these cables and you'll find a Y axis cable. This is gonna go in the back of the adapter that we just worked with. You're gonna put that through the bottom of the base. Then you're gonna snake it up towards the left-hand side if you're looking at the machine from the back and you can pull it through the hole beside that left side linear module. Next, we're gonna install our second splitter and the orientation is the same as the first and it will also use four of these M4 by 30 socket head cap screws. This splitter is intended to connect the two Z-axis linear modules. Those Z-axis cables can also get routed under the base and then come up through that hole ahead of those splitters and then plug into the right-hand side adapter. Then we can grab the cable clearly labeled with the Z, plug that into the back of the right-hand side adapter, loop it through the bottom of the base, back up towards the left-hand side of the machine when looking at it from the back, and route it through that hole and out beside the left-hand side Z-axis module. Once I had the cables in their general position, I decided to take a little more care into the cable management. I have these very handy cut to length Velcro tie wraps and I'll put a link to those in the video description down below. The great thing about them is that they are soft and non-abrasive. Next, the controller will be installed in this orientation on the back of one of the Z-axis linear modules. M4 by 30 socket and cap screws will be used. They'll go through those slots and just like those adapters that I had previously talked about, don't over tighten these screws. Each receptacle on the side of the controller has a nice little dust boot. You're gonna pull back the third from the top and you'll find a label for X. You can plug in your X axis module. Below that, there is the Y axis and below that one, there is the Z axis. Go ahead and plug in all of those cables. Then you can go back to your touchscreen box and find your touchscreen. I had to take a moment and actually marvel at how much this thing feels like a decent quality phone. It sits on the magnetic holder at the front of the base and then connects to the controller with a USB-C connector. Next, we'll tackle the power module. And this is pretty straightforward. On the back of the module, you have an on and off switch and then you have an AC input and a DC output. The cable for the DC output can be found in the cables box and it looks like this. Simply plug one end into the power module 
And at this point in time, you can also plug in the cable for the incoming AC power. The other end of the DC power cable will get inserted into the control module and this connector right here. All of these connectors are keyed, so don't worry about plugging anything in backwards. Now in this video, we're gonna be focusing on the 3D printing capabilities of the Snapmaker A250T, and therefore we're gonna be only using the 3D printing tool head. In future videos, I'll cover the other modules. Now we need our bag of M4 by eight socket head cap screws, and we're going to be attaching our 3D printing tool head to the X carriage. In this view from behind the tool head, you can see which holes are being used. And then we can grab our tool head cable, plug it into the top of the 3D printing tool head, and from there we can route it over to the top connector in the side of the control module. This is also a good time to assemble the spool holder, and the rod and the bracket are held together with a single M4 by 10 socket head cap screw. Make sure that screw is pretty tight, we don't want that thing falling off, then we can attach this bracket to the inside face of the Z-axis linear module opposite of the controller. This machine is really starting to take shape and one of the last big components we need is the heated print bed and it will attach to the platform using these M4x10 flathead screws. Once that's secured in place, the magnetic flex plate will snap in place on top. The heated bed cable will connect to this port on the side of the controller and that will conclude the wiring of this machine. Your controller should now look something like this, and you can see I've used more of those cut to length Velcro cable ties to organize the cables a little bit better. And the final piece of hardware to install is also related to cable management, and it's this small cable clip. It attaches to the inside face of the Z-axis linear module right beside the controller, and it uses these M4 by eight socket head cap screws. The tool head cable slips in place so it doesn't get tangled up on anything. With the 3D printing assembly now complete, we can run through the initial setup. Remove the protective film on the touchscreen and power on your new Snapmaker A250T. You should be greeted with the Snapmaker logo, some pretty cool graphics on that amazing little touchscreen, and you'll notice that on the power supply, there's a breathing LED light. Follow the on-screen prompts to select your language, name your machine, and connect it to your Wi-Fi. And then it should prompt you to create a bed leveling mesh. The machine will probe several points on the bed in this spiral pattern, and at the end of it, you'll be prompted to set the Z offset. If you're new to 3D printing, the Z offset is essentially the measurement between the nozzle and the print bed on the first layer of your print. And to set this up, Snapmaker has included a calibration card. The calibration card is basically just a really nice piece of paper, and on the touchscreen you'll see up and down arrows. You'll also see selectable increments by which those up and down arrows move the nozzle. Place the calibration card between the nozzle and the print bed, and use the arrows to achieve a nozzle position where the nozzle is slightly dragging on that calibration card. Ideally, you're looking for a light to medium drag on that calibration card. To run some initial test prints, I'm going to be using the included Snapmaker Black PLA. The next message on the screen will ask you to heat the nozzle. You can press continue and you'll see the nozzle temperature rise to 200 degrees Celsius. Take your roll of filament and make sure you do not tangle the filament. Place the end of it into the top of the extruder and once the nozzle temperature has reached 200 degrees Celsius, you can press the load button. The filament will get drawn through the print head and you'll prime the nozzle. You should see black filament come out the bottom. At this point, my machine also warned me that some of my linear modules needed a firmware update. So I went into settings, I clicked on firmware update, check for updates, and sure enough, there is a firmware update available. And since the machine is connected to Wi-Fi, it will do the entire firmware update over the air, no SD cards involved. On my computer, I headed over to the Snapmaker website, downloaded the Lubin software, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, and then selected my machine, got set up with 3D printing, and the very first time you run the software, it'll walk you through the different areas of the user interface. Take some time to familiarize yourself with the user interface as it's a bit different from other slicers that I've used in the past. To complete the wireless connection between Lubin and your machine, click on workspace and then the name of your machine should be detected on your network and you can press connect. On the touch screen on your machine, you'll see a request for the connection, hit okay, and then it'll prompt you to home the machine. 
Now I'm gonna navigate back out of the workspace view. I'm gonna click on the sample model that they've included here. I'm gonna delete it. I'm going to click on the folder. I'm going to find a calibration cube. And this is a pretty standard little object that we can print here to just test the accuracy and general printing properties of the printer. And on the right hand side, there's a quick access section to some of the print settings that can be changed. Just to get started quickly, I'm going to click on more settings and then I'm going to click on one of these presets such as fast print or normal print. And then I can click on generate G code in the bottom right hand corner. The G code toolpath will be created and I'll be presented with a screen that will give me a layer by layer preview of the object that I'm about to print. Then if I click on export, the workspace view will come back up and I can choose to start the job. If you select start on Lubin, it will start it right from your computer. And if you send it to the device, it'll transfer the file to the memory on your printer. So let's see how this first print comes out. I purposely did not fiddle with any of these settings. I wanna get a general feel for how this machine performs with just all of the default settings. And if you guys have looked at any of the other content on my channel, you'll know that I've done quite a bit of 3D printing in the past. And so my first impressions of this machine as it's printing the very first object is that it's not really going all that fast, at least not on the default settings. But that's okay, we'll try and push the machine a little bit harder later. For now, it's just nice to see that the first layer is going down really well and I don't have to do any sort of troubleshooting, so the bed mesh must have been pretty accurate. And that's good news for beginners and people new to 3D printing. Troubleshooting first layer adhesion issues can be frustrating and a little bit discouraging if it is your very first print and it's starting to look like a big mess of spaghetti. Now as this part is starting to take shape on the print bed, it's looking not bad, but I do see some print artifacts that I was hoping not to see even in this fast setting. This leads me to believe that this print head is not going to be blazing fast. And this is likely one of the compromises that you're going to have to make because this is a three in one machine. When a print is done, you can just press the complete button and then you can take that flex plate and lift it off of the platform. You can now gently bend the flex plate and pull your print off. On the faces of the cube, you can see some ringing and ghosting. I think you guys should be able to see it in the video with the reflections of the light. In person, it's a little more noticeable, but overall the faces are still pretty smooth. Even the top solid layer there with the Z. The details around the lettering could be a little bit sharper. It's not quite as bad on the X, but for the Y, right in the middle of that letter, it looks like it's lacking a little bit of part cooling. This is something I'll try to address a little bit later. And now using a set of digital calipers, we can check the dimensional accuracy. So along the X axis, that's pretty good. We're only 0.2 millimeters off nominal. And along the Y axis, even better, 0.1 millimeters off nominal. And along the Z axis, it will be 0.13 millimeters off. And that's at a layer height of 0.16 millimeters. It makes me wonder if maybe the firmware is not compensating in the Z direction for the Z offset, perhaps. Since this printer seems to be excellent in terms of dimensional accuracy, I've created these test pieces here for an upcoming project that I'll show you guys at the end of this video. And we're gonna test out these 3D printed threads. Now for this print here, I've only changed the layer height to 0.24 millimeters. And it's never a great idea to change too many settings at once. It's very easy to lose track of the effect of all of those changes. At the 0.24 millimeter layer height with the same linear speeds, the printer does seem to be able to keep up. So that's a good sign. And that's definitely gonna help us cut down on some print time. So far, the quality of the print is looking okay, but we'll take a closer look now that the print is done. And again, we can peel these parts off of the flex plate. Under a brighter light, the exterior round faces looked better than the flat faces on those smaller cubes. However, on the inside where we have this 45 degree conical overhang, it looks pretty messy. The threads are shorter overhangs and the female threads look a tad messier than the exterior male threads. And from my experience with 3D printing, I can tell this is going to be a part cooling issue. On this print head, the part cooling fan duct only exits on one side of the nozzle. And I can tell already that when I'm printing those interior threads and that conical shape, that the part is not being effectively cooled. Despite this, the fit of the threads was still excellent. 
but I'm gonna have to keep this in mind for future prints. This next print is much larger, and it's part of the project that I will reveal later in the video. A larger part with more surface area touching the print bed will test the auto bed leveling a little bit more. The first layers went down flawless, and this printer has absolutely no issues with auto bed leveling, it seems. So that's great. The only not so great thing is getting those prints off of this PC coated flex plate. Even after allowing the print to fully cool down, it's very difficult to get prints that are very large off of the flex plate. As far as how this part looks, I would say it's marginal at best. I really tried to increase the speed here so this part wouldn't take so long to print, but there's some visible zits on the sides, there are stringing issues on the inside, and the overhangs don't look so clean again. I am working outside of the default parameters that come with the Lumen Slicer, but I still expected a little bit more, so we'll try and improve this later. Sometimes print issues can be resolved just by changing filament. I needed to print some lenses to diffuse LED light, so I switched over to this clear PLA from D3D Filaments. This very simple cylinder was printed in spiral vase mode, so it's only one wall thick. From my experience, a vase mode print, especially with clear PLA, will reveal any mechanical issues if there is some on the printer. If there are issues with controlling the nozzle temperature, you may see changes in clarity through the wall of the part. And if there are mechanical accuracy or alignment issues, you may also see severe banding through the part. And so with these various clear lenses that I printed, I did not experience any of that. The clarity of the walls and the extrusion seemed extremely consistent, and that was really nice to see. I didn't even find any random gaps in the print, so these were very high quality printed lenses. I own a lot of 3D printers at this point, and I would go out on a limb and say that these are probably the nicest lenses that I've printed on any of my printers so far. Now for these lenses, I was pretty conservative about the print speed, but it was definitely within an acceptable range for what I would expect of a print of that size. Now I wanted to switch materials one more time to another opaque PLA, so I changed over to this Polyterra Green. This print did go really well, although the brim severely stuck to that print bed and it was a huge pain to get it off later. You can see a lot of fine stringing and I'm switching between filaments here so I'd have to do a little more fine tuning for each one, but overall I slowed this part down a little bit and the walls came out a lot nicer. Now I just wanna go back and talk about that brim that got stuck for just one more second. I had to pick and scrape this thing off with a razor blade, which isn't the safest thing and it's also very tedious and frustrating. Additionally, I ended up causing some minor damage to the flex plate itself. Now luckily there is a better alternative and that is a PEI coated flex plate. PEI will stick just as well when it's hot, but when the flex plate cools down, it releases parts much easier than these PC coated flex plates. Also what's great about some of these PEI coated flex plates is that they are double sided at least the ones that I sell on my website, embracemaking.com. One side is smooth and one side is textured, so it's kind of like you get two plates in one. Now I do prefer PLA on the smooth side and I tend to print PETG on the textured side. The textured side will transfer that pattern to your part and I think it looks really nice. So if you want to get one of these flex plates for yourself and at the same time support my work, head on over to my website, embracemaking.com. Currently I have one on the way for my own snap maker. And speaking of upgrades, let's circle back and revisit that part cooling issue. Designing upgrades is kind of what I do, and I feel like it brings additional value to these videos as well as to the 3D printing and maker community. So I took it upon myself to design this dual duct part cooling fan adapter. It uses the original part cooling fan located on the inside of the 3D printing tool head, and it's a drop in replacement for the original. Now in the interest of not having this video drag on too long, I'll do a separate video released about the same time as this one showing how to install this part. If you want to get your hands on one, you can find them on my website, which again is another way to support me and my work, but I'll also make this file available for free with a printables link in the video description down below. Now if you buy it from my website as a thank you, I will also include a free spool holder that fits the Snapmaker A250 and A350T. And if you print your own, I would recommend printing it in something with a higher temperature resistance than PLA. Now we can take a look at the effect of using the dual duct adapter. I've printed a total of eight calibration cubes. The grouping of four on the left 
is before the dual duct and the grouping on the right is after the dual duct. I didn't change any G code for the matching pairs and this first set was printed in the regular calibration cube XYZ orientation. These are printed at 0.2 millimeter layer height and I printed them at speeds faster than what the presets come with in the Lubin slicer. In this case, what I noticed is that the flat faces look a little better on the dual duct, but where you really see the difference is on the Y side of the cube. On the single duct version, the Y side of the cube faces away from the single part cooling duct. On the single duct version, the surface is kind of wavy and you can see a loss of detail in the middle of that Y. On the dual duct version on the right hand side, it's extremely sharp. And that's because we now have that second duct facing the Y side of the cube. In the second set of cubes, we're likely going to see a similar result because I printed these at a slightly slower speed. So this is pretty much the standard fast preset setting within the Lubin slicer. The cubes are printed in the default orientation. And you can see again, the surfaces here are pretty comparable, except again for when it comes to the Y faces. The reason for printing slower at this preset speed was to prove that this problem exists even with one of the default settings. In my opinion, this is a problem that shouldn't exist on default settings, yet it does. But at least we know how to solve it. This next set of cubes was printed at a 45 degree angle. And the reason I did this was to see if this would make a difference in the print quality for the original single duct. And to my disappointment, it didn't really seem to make that much of a difference with the single duct. And this sort of makes sense because even at a 45 degree angle, that Y face is really still not facing that single duct. The dual duct version looks a lot sharper, especially around all the details of that letter Y. Now the other benefit, which I sort of failed to point out on some of the other cubes, was the corners of the cubes themselves. On this 45 degree angle print, it's not quite as obvious, but on some of the other prints, the cube corners turned out quite a bit sharper on the dual duct. And now finally, just to really drive the point home, what I did here was I mirrored these parts. So these parts now have the Y face on the opposite side. So on the single duct version, the Y face is now facing the single duct of the part cooling. And so if what I'm saying here is true, we'll see that on the Y side of the cube, again, on the left hand side with the single duct, the Y will now appear very sharp and take a look at that it does, but it also does on the dual duct version on the right hand side. And that's the whole point. The dual duct version gives you even part cooling, no matter what the orientation. And by the time this video has been published, I'll have another option for you guys looking for even more performance. Since the original part cooling fan is undersized for this fairly modest hot end, I figured why not upgrade to a 4010 radial fan. The new parts will interface with the dual duct adapter that I just showed you. And hopefully now this will allow you to utilize the maximum throughput of this hot end. Check my website for availability. The Snapmaker motto appears to be make something wonderful. And so I've attempted to do just that and I want to get you guys involved too. I've designed the beginnings of what I've envisioned as a modular smart lamp. It all centers around this base. So earlier in the video, I showed you that I printed this base in black on the Snapmaker and it has these female threads on the inside and the red part I'm holding in my hand is the collet and it has the male threads. Now this is gonna be the base of this light fixture and so I went ahead and reprinted the parts in white and that's because white will reflect a lot of the light quite a bit better. Now I wanted to keep this thing as simple and as accessible as possible so no soldering or cutting or splicing of wires required at all. It utilizes one of these standard bulb sockets with extension cord and integrated switch. I'll put a link in the video description down below so you can see the exact model that I'm using. And since this is an E26 receptacle, you can just get yourself a regular E26 based smart bulb. Personally, I recommend this one from Vocalink and I'll put a link to that in the description down below as well. Whatever you do, don't use an incandescent bulb as it'll be way too hot for these PLA plastic parts. Get yourself an LED bulb. To start assembling the base, the cord and the switch will get fed through the base. The receptacle will sit in this pocket and the collet will slip over top and thread into the base. Depending on the tolerances of your printer, 
you may be able to start threading your bulb in and thread it all the way down completely. If your printer tolerances are a bit loose and the bulb and receptacle are spinning around while you're trying to tighten it, you can always just remove the collet, tighten the bulb with the collet removed, and then reinstall the collet. And because the bulb receptacle has a slight taper to it, the collet locks it in place and does not allow it to fall out. At the bottom of the base, there's a cutout for the cord, so it allows it to sit flat on the table. Now this next part is where I want to get you guys involved and turn this into kind of a community project. The concept here is that this lamp is modular, so it allows you to take what I'm calling are these sleeves and then insert them over top of the base and decorate your lamp to your liking. The sleeves have a tongue and groove type of feature on them, so they interlock with one another. And this gray one here has another cutout, and this one would go on the bottom for the core to pass through. I've designed these particular ones with a hexagon pattern on them. Then to diffuse the light, I printed this lens in clear PLA in spiral vase mode. It simply slips over top and sits around the lip of the base. And finally for the top, I made a cap. And this top piece has a closed surface on the very top, so you won't see the top of the bulb. However, again, this is where I want you guys to get creative. I'm gonna make all the design files available, and I want you guys to really expand on these ideas. Maybe you wanna open the top, maybe you want to stack more of those sleeves in the bottom, print them in different colors, print different style lenses. You could change the height of the lenses, you could emboss different patterns on the sleeves. You could even stack a whole bunch of sleeves and drastically change the overall height of the lamp and then use a more traditional lampshade on the top. This example here is mostly just one wall thick and I printed it in white PLA. The white PLA gives a bit of a softer look than the clear PLA and it just all depends on the look that you're going after. Obviously the color combinations of the sleeves that I have going on here don't match and this is just purely for demonstration. The sleeves don't even have to be round and you could even make square sleeves. I'm really just trying to get the creative juices flowing here. I'm going to make all the design files available in hopes that you guys get involved and start making your own designs. I would love to see what you guys can come up with working around this standardized base. One other thing to remember here is that if you guys come up with a combination that you really like and you want to make it permanent, you can use super glue or hot glue to secure those pieces together so that they'll never come apart. I'm gonna make another video entirely dedicated to this project with even more ideas. But I wanna leave you guys with one final idea. And if you print yourself a single walled smooth lens, you can print out a logo or pattern or whatever you like on a regular piece of white paper. You can cut the paper to size, wrap it around the inside of that lens, and it will show through fairly well. And this is just regular clear PLA. Then you can put one of the lids on top and you have yourself a pretty interesting backlit logo. If any of you guys print your own or make your own parts, start using the hashtag modular smart lamp on your social media. I have even more ideas on how to expand on this project. And as I complete the other two videos for the Snapmaker using the CNC tool head and the laser tool head, you'll see more accessories for the modular smart lamp come to light. This project doesn't have to be limited to purely 3D printing. So now that I've been using this machine for a while, what do I think of it? Well, overall, I think that they put a lot of time and effort into this machine and it has a ton of potential. The frame is very rigid. All of the components seem like they're of very high quality. Even that touchscreen feels like a modern cell phone. The decision to go with CAN bus to communicate between all the modules and the main controller was pretty interesting. Uh, this is definitely not a bottom dollar bargain machine by any means, uh, so it definitely has that potential. However, in terms of performance, so far I've only used the 3D printing module, so I can really only comment on that for now. In terms of the 3D printing module, I was a little disappointed that the part cooling fan was so drastically undersized for the hot end. And that's really holding back the capabilities of this 3D printing module in my opinion. And that's one of the reasons why I designed all those upgrades that I showed you guys earlier. The other major issue that I had was the stickiness of that PC coated bill plate. I've complained about this with other manufacturers as well. Snapmaker is not the only one to be doing this, but it's too sticky. If those two issues were addressed, this machine as a 3D printer alone would be a pretty respectable machine amongst other competitors who are just doing 3D printing. In terms of software, the Lubin application was not bad for slicing, although I did find a few bugs in that application, and that was when it came to setting custom material settings as well as some of the custom print settings. Now, I reached out to Snapmaker, and to their credit, they were already aware of those issues, and they were working on a fix, and they had the fix turned around real quick, 
and they released an alpha version and sent me that link. So I can at least say that they are actively working on the software and they're trying to make improvements and the customer service and technical support seems to be there. What's nice is that the machine reads G-code files. And so even if you don't wanna use the Lubin slicer for slicing files for the A250T, you can always fall back on other slicers out there on the market. I get the impression that they're very active in making updates to the software and the firmware. So you as a consumer wouldn't be out of luck if you were to buy this machine. And speaking of firmware, the other thing I really liked about this machine was the over the air firmware updates. I had zero issues connecting this thing to Wi-Fi as well as connecting it to my laptop on the Lumen Slicer. The firmware updates happened very seamlessly and I didn't have to mess around with inserting SD cards, formatting them, and going through that whole process that you might be familiar with with other brands of 3D printers. So who would I recommend this product for? And I would say that this machine is probably most suitable for somebody looking to do one of the three things this machine is capable of uh, most often. And the other two things you're not gonna be doing very frequently, you're gonna be doing from time to time, but you want the capability there when you do need it. And that way you don't need to take up uh, valuable space and money, of course, for buying dedicated machines for those other two functions. And for this theoretical person, there are upgrades pretty much for all of the modules, whether it's directly from Snapmaker or aftermarket things that people have developed. So if you are focusing on that one process, there are upgrades for these machines available to really increase the capabilities of that one tool head that you're using. And then of course, the other two, like I said, that you're not using as frequently, at least they're still there for when you need them. And so conversely, if you're the type of person who would be using all three of these modules constantly, then I would be looking at investing into dedicated machines for 3D printing, CNC machining, and laser cutting. Now, swapping between the modules is pretty quick and easy, but if you were doing this, again, like I was saying, all day, every day, that would be a very inefficient workflow. Overall, I'm really looking forward to testing with those last two modules after we wrap up this video, and I'm gonna be putting them to good use for that modular smart lighting project that I showed you guys earlier. And if you guys are looking for links to that project or anything else that I brought up in this video, check the video description down below. That's where I always put all of the resources and relevant links. And if you guys haven't already subscribed to my channel, I would really appreciate you guys hitting that subscribe button and getting on board. And finally, checking out my website if you wanna support my work, embracemaking.com. So thanks again to Snapmaker for sending me the A250. And I can't wait to show you guys the last two videos in this series. Thanks for watching.